Hello. Warning after warning of more risks abroad. Are we living in a more dangerous world? Wherever you look, tensions are rising. Strikes in Syria, the ongoing bombardment in Gaza, no stop to Houthi attacks in the Red Sea. And Israel's prime minister saying no thanks to the two-state solution the West sees as the eventual answer. Netanyahu's words were unacceptable. Of course the Palestinian people deserve a state. But with the UK grappling with global threats. It is a question of fairness. What a farce. Parliament still arguing over migrants that come to British shores. The Prime Minister's plan for Rwanda about to arrive in the Lords. The Conservative Party has come together. The Rwanda bill has passed. It's now time for the Lords to pass this bill too. So our big question this morning, how can we protect Britain at home and abroad? Defence Secretary Grant Shapps is with us to answer that question. How would Yvette Cooper, who wants to be Labour's Home Secretary, manage the risks at home? And in the latest of our election year interviews, the First Minister of Scotland claims he knows what's going to happen. It is undoubtedly the case that Keir Starmer uh, doesn't need Scotland uh, to win. He's going to be the next Prime Minister of the UK. How does he know? Morning, morning. Welcome to you and welcome to my trio at the desk with me today, Simon Reeve, the intrepid explorer who's been travelling around the world making TV for more than 20 years, lucky for some. Conservative peer, Baroness Nikki Morgan, who was in the Cabinet for many years, and businessman, multi-millionaire and philanthropist, Sir Tom Hunter. Very warm welcome to all three of you today. Let's start with what is making the news. The BBC website is leading on the latest utterance from the Israeli Prime Minister saying a two-state solution cannot be the answer to the conflict in the Middle East. The papers, though, are a mixed bunch today. The Sunday Mirror splashes with pictures of post office bosses partying during that scandal. The Sunday Times sticks with that story. There are the faces of some of the sub-postmasters and mistresses who lost so much but who died before their claims were resolved. But it leads with the risk to kids from measles. The Sunday Express says rather boldly that high-speed rail is back on track, reporting on planned secret talks next week. Let's see. And the Mail on Sunday has Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, comparing himself to Nigel Lawson, who famously, you will remember, cut taxes. Right, let's have a word with our panel before we speak to the Defence Secretary. Great to have you all with us. Um, Nikki, first of all, you were in Cabinet for a long time. When you have a situation like this, where tensions are visibly bubbling up mm -hmm. in such distressing ways, far from home, mm -hmm. what does that feel like as a politician trying to grapple with it? Well, good morning. I think it sort of has a shadow over everything else, really, because, um, of course, uh, every domestic issue is extremely important, and that's what those cabinet ministers with domestic portfolios are focused on. But I think it sort of almost um, it compares, and, and perhaps you understand that the Prime Minister, the, the Foreign Secretary, the Defence Secretary, you know, are very distracted by what's mm. happening around the world, because, of course, when you've got that great uncertainty, um, actually, it sort of everything pales into insignificance, I guess. So it kind of casts a shadow. I mean, Sir Tom, you've run lots of different businesses over many years. When you have this kind of instability, what kind of effect does it have? Well, I mean, entrepreneurs, um, what we've got to do is just go on with it. Um, we like to worry about the things we can control. We have absolutely no control over these things. Mm. But it seems to me the geopolitical risk in the world today is the highest it's ever been in my lifetime. Really? You feel that? I do. And when you're making decisions then about whether or not to invest, whether or not to spend money, does it cause hesitation? Or if you look at what's happened to supply chains? Well, it's something to take into consideration. But again, I say business people worry about the things we can control and get on with it. Now, Simon, you've travelled to many of the countries where we now see instability and causes for concern. But you're also one of the first people to write about Osama bin Laden. I suppose one of the problems with all of this is the roots of these dilemmas go back such a long time. Such a long time and they haven't been addressed or resolved. 
So yes, I think um, it's interesting what, what you're saying, Tom, about, I, I think you're right. I think this is a very dangerous moment. Um, comparable perhaps, perhaps to that period before the start of the First World War even. And by that, I mean things can go a peaceful way or there can just be one small incident that erupts all of us into a much more catastrophic situation even than we've got now. And do you really feel that with all your experience going well, to I different th countries? I think if we world? look back in history, we can see it can just be small incidents that create chaos. The First World War was started just by one, one guy, wasn't it? When the Archduke took a wrong turn and, and is shot. So these, these terrible world events can be created and sparked by small incidents. And we've got a lot of those small incidents underway at the moment. Well, that's exactly what we're going to talk to the Defence Secretary about. And last week, you'll remember, the Foreign Secretary, David Cameron, told us that he found it hard to remember a more dangerous world. There's no sign of peace in Ukraine. The conflict in Gaza has begun to spread. And just yesterday, Iranian security forces were killed in a strike in Syria. And the British and American targeting of Houthis in Yemen after strikes on shipping in the Red Sea doesn't seem to have stopped the attacks. So what does this all mean for the UK and indeed for our defence budget, how much we spend? Grant Shapps, the Defence Secretary, is here, as we've said. Warm welcome to you this morning. Now, you made your first big speech as Defence Secretary on Monday and you warned people we are in a pre-war world. For our viewers, does that mean they should be listening to you this morning and expecting and preparing themselves for more conflicts in the years to come? Morning. Um, I think really, actually, as your panel were just saying, uh, we are clearly living in a far more complex world. The United Nations has just said that last year was the, the year with the most conflicts since the Second World War. Uh, and the point I was making, without wanting to frighten anyone or, 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 or raise uh, concerns which are unwarranted, because I don't think that is a, a good approach, is we need to be ready. We need to be prepared. We need to understand the era in which we are living, where both states and more irrational ones like Iran, North Korea, and non-state actors, the Houthis uh, that we've seen uh, active in the Red Sea. Mm. I was in the Red Sea last week to, to thank uh, our, our, our people on HMS Diamond uh, and many other groups who we would have thought in the first part of this century were the non-state actors, Daesh and all the rest of them, joining together and using more sophisticated weapons. It's and so all of that combines to a more dangerous world. And it's not just in the Middle East. It's also, of course, the threat from Russia. And I'd like to show people what one of the military chiefs at NATO, our Defence Alliance, said this week, Rob Bauer. He says, we have to realise it's not a given that we are in peace and we are preparing for a conflict with Russia. Now, the UK is a vital part of NATO. Are you preparing our forces for a conflict with Russia? So we actually have an operation that I just announced in that speech on, on Monday, um, which uh, is in, in Europe uh, to uh, practice uh, what we need to do uh, if there were uh, further conflict in, in Europe. And that's called Steadfast Defender. Uh, and that is uh, 40,000 uh, personnel, troops in total, uh, of which we're supplying 40% uh, of the ground force, 50% overall. Um, so the UK leading 31 other nations in that action. Now, that is because, as NATO says, we always need to be prepared. Now, I should say, we always exercise with other nations. We always carry these things out. This is the largest we've done because Putin clearly represents a clear and present danger. And it is rather different, isn't it, from saying we have to be prepared. He said we are preparing. You are carrying out the biggest exercise in a long time of its kind. So how would you assess the chances then of some further incursion on, on, on Eastern Europe? You know, we know that there are significant worries about Putin, but can you explain to people how likely you think that is? Well, look, I think, first of all, this is partly still in our hands, in the West's hands. We have saw, we saw Putin invade. Uh, he's been pushed back from 50% of the land that he took in Ukraine, in no small part because Britain took the leading role in providing uh, training, mm -hmm. uh, anti-tank missiles, tanks, long-range weapons. We can do things about it. And just last week, a week before, mm. the Prime Minister announced the biggest ever package 
to Ukraine in order to help defend but it. So, so the answer to your question in part mm -hmm. is it depends how we deal with the current threat. But it, we know also that the bigger source of funding from the US right now has been drying mm. up and goodness knows what will happen politically there. It could potentially disappear. And your counterpart in Germany, the German defence minister, suggested that within five years there might be conflict with Russia. So my counterpart in Germany echoed uh, what I was saying in the speech where I said in the next five years there are a series of uh, concerns, including nation states, including non-state actors, uh, which you could see potentially uh, creating bigger problems. But this is still in our hands. Britain has, again, as with all of those other things, led the way with the £2.5 billion package and a security agreement, uh, a cooperation agreement with uh, President Zelensky and Ukraine. Now, and you ask about America, not just America, but Europe needs to step up and do their part to make sure that Ukraine can continue to defend herself. Let's talk then though about the money, because all of the things that you want to do to protect this country and to play Britain's part around the world are very expensive. We spend more than £50 billion a year on defence already. And the Conservatives have long made a commitment to increase that amount to 2.5% of GDP, the sum of all the things that the economy produces. When will you hit that target? Because you said many times, it's an aspiration, it's what we want to do. But if the threats are as serious as you say today, can you give people a commitment on when you will hit that target? So we've, we've always said we'll do it when economic conditions allow. And uh, we've seen economic, we've seen us turn the corner, thanks to some of the difficult decisions that we've been making. Inflation coming down, uh, growth in the economy to the point where we've started to see expenditure on defence, amongst other things, uh, rise. So we're comfortably above 2%, which was mm. the figure that had been settled on for a long time. We're one of uh, a minority of NATO countries who mm. spend more than that 2%. In terms of timing, uh, as soon as the econ economic conditions allow, and, and we look forward to making progress on that, but can you as give we people fix a the date? economy. But can you give people a date? Because, you know, you know this, to govern is to choose. Mm. It's a political choice on what you spend money on. It would be more than £10 billion to get up to that 2.5 billion, 2.5% of GDP. But if the threat is evolving and increasing as quickly and as mm. seriously as you claim, is it credible to say that while not giving people a firm commitment on when you'll hit that target? So, I mean, the trajectory is already upwards. So I've already got a lot more money to spend, £288 billion in the next decade on equipment, for example. Uh, you can only increase the budget at a certain rate because mm -hmm. it, even if I had 2.5% tomorrow, you wouldn't be able to spend it tomorrow. So there is a trajectory upwards. I can't give you the exact date because we've always said it's as the economic conditions uh, allow. But the point is we're working to a plan and, uh, you know, as, 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 we've, as we've commented, uh, no one else will be able to say, Labour won't be able to say, Labour won't be able to say when they do this because they our, don't but have view, a plan. But, to our, but our viewers will hear you saying, take this really seriously, but you, I can't tell you when I'm actually going to get the money that you would like to have. And there is a tension there. There is also, though, a question of capability. And yesterday, many of our viewers will have seen, we saw two British Navy ships crash into each other in a port in Bahrain. Now, that is a pretty embarrassing thing to happen. It's a pretty embarrassing thing then for our allies to see on the world stage. It was HMS Chiddingfold and HMS Bangor. We can see the ships in, on a happier day on our screen now. How on earth did that happen? Uh, the answer is I don't know. Obviously, they're investigating. Accidents sometimes happen uh, at sea as they do in the air. And when there's an air aviation accident, what we do is we allow the authorities to investigate. The exact same thing is happening here. I immediately spoke to the first sea lord in charge of the Navy, uh, and he's confirmed that investigation's already underway. And, of course, we look forward to finding out uh, what the causes were. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would say um, I was on HMS Diamond on uh, Thursday uh, thanking uh, our brave men and women, that, com that ship company's crew who've been uh, defending us against the shipping and themselves against the Houthi missiles. The professionalism overall is an extraordinary thing to see. But there are real worries, though, significant worries, and you know this, 
about the capabilities of the British military, the Navy and the Army and the Air Force. Almost every day, people who used to work in the services are saying openly that they're concerned about things being stretched and stretched and stretched, partly because of the increasing activity that we are seeing. And even your colleague, Penny Mordaunt, who's a government minister, used to be Defence Secretary, she said online this morning, the Royal Navy must keep pace with growing capabilities, capabilities of other nations. Mm. I mean, she's clearly concerned well, look, not uh, enough money's going uh, I, I, I mean, I'm in a, a post where there are a lot of people with opinions and a lot of people who've been in the um, military and armed forces will often and express them. And shouldn't you listen to them? And I absolutely do. And by the way, I have a lot of these former generals who you often see. I have them all in um, periodically and I, I chat to them because I do want to listen to them. But I would say, you know, we have, for example, uh, the largest uh, ships that we have ever put to sea in the aircraft carriers. I toss it up, I think, 13 frigates and destroyers, which are under commission uh, at the moment. We're modernizing the Navy, going through this massive recapitalization program. And just this morning, uh, for example, I, I put on um, X uh, or Twitter um, uh, yesterday um, uh, the results of a, a new weapon, which is a, a laser weapon called Dragonfire, capable of doing what those men and women on, on HMS uh, Diamond have been doing with the Sea Viper missile system and doing it with a laser instead to bring down the incoming. So the technology is also moving on very fast as well as the investment. But in as we've seen Navy. in Ukraine, a kind of warfare which people thought had maybe gone for good mm -hmm. is very much back. And our forces are getting smaller. You've not been able to hit your recruitment target. The target last year for getting new people into the army was 8,000. You only recruited 5,500. Now, the company running that recruitment, Capita, have blamed your rules. They said it's partly because the rules say you can't allow anyone with tattoos into the army. Would well, you be open to changing the yes, rules uh, if it meant we get the military that we need? Yes. I mean, first of all, it's not true that people with tattoos can't go into the army, just to clear that up. And secondly, um, you know, I do believe in, in uh, creating an army uh, fit for the modern age, which means that some of the old taboos may not uh, apply anymore. Absolutely. But when it comes to the Air Force, for example, and you, you raise that as an example, uh, we've got not only fifth generation fighter jets, so uh, that's the, the F-35, and we're committed to more of those, but a sixth generation uh, that we're working with Italy and Japan on. And I would say, actually, the Ukraine war, as you've said, does show conventional things still matter, mm -hmm. but also new things like drones and swarms of drones. And again, the UK has announced a £200 million programme, which will make us the biggest drone provider and development partner for Ukraine uh, in the world. So we intend to lead on those things too. But if the threat is going up, why is the size of our forces going down? I mean, our full-time trained army personnel is 73,000 in 2025. That's your target. It was more than 80,000 in 2021. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, so I, ever since I've had this job, I've noticed that people often conflate our armed forces with one specific part of it. In other words, the, uh, the, the, the army. Um, and uh, that's wrong to do because uh, the, the full armed force is 188,000 right now. Um, and that includes all the different services. And then, if, of course, you've got new areas like cyber and space as well. It's not the number of people alone that matters. It's the lethality. It's how, how uh, a capable our systems are of defence. And as we've seen in the conflicts which we've mentioned so far, they've not been about sending land forces. But when we've been asked to in, for example, uh, this uh, uh, Steadfast Defender, this is the NATO mm -hmm. operation in Europe, which country is providing 40 percent of this 32 country combination, the United Kingdom. We're it providing 40% of the land forces. So we can turn them out when we need to. And that's really important. What their political leaders also instruct or decide of obviously matters enormously and maybe nowhere more so right now than in Israel. Now, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli leader there, his spokesman said overnight, after Hamas is destroyed, Israel must retain security control over Gaza. That is a requirement that contradicts the demand for Palestinian sovereignty. Now, it's been the UK's position and many other countries for a long time that there must be two states, the two state mm. solution. What is the UK doing to urge him to shift that view? Mm. I think it's very disappointing uh, that Benjamin Netanyahu has uh, said that. Uh, it's not in some sense as a surprise. He's spent his entire political career uh, against a two state solution. But the point is, which other route is there to seriously resolve this? Palestinians deserve a sovereign state. 
Israel deserves uh, to have uh, the full uh, ability to uh, defend itself, its own security, in other words. And unless you pursue a, a two-state solution, I really don't see that there is another solution. Now, you'll get a lot of different views within mm -hmm. the Israeli uh, government, of course. It is a, uh, a, a rainbow uh, coalition. Uh, so we very much distinguish between mm -hmm. the views of individuals and our overall support uh, for Israel as a country. But it's interesting, you've said that's dis disappointing, just briefly. Um, would you bet a fiver on the uh, Rwanda legislation being passed by the House of Lords? I very much hope it is. Uh, it's time to, you know, stop the boats and, and essentially send the planes because there isn't another way again to solve this. And I just have to say, I appeal uh, to Keir Starmer and Labour to stop frustrating and blocking conservative efforts to stop these boats from well, coming. Well, it's up to the House At of Lords this week. Well, no, it's not. not. You see, that, party, this so is we'll what they keep saying, we'll but they control that a bit the House later. of Lords. We'll, we'll talk uh, about that a bit later with Baroness Dickie Morgan. We talked about it at length with Keir Starmer last week and indeed with Rishi Sunak the week before. But Grant Shapps, thank you very much thank indeed you. for coming in this morning. Now, we will chew all that over in a few minutes and our politicians are all having to respond to a changing world. Of course, the political map has changed here too a lot in the last few years, not least in Scotland where the once almighty SNP lost its all-powerful boss, lost its secure lead in the polls and could lose half its seats in the general election. It's lost its mojo. Well, on Thursday, I sat down with the First Minister, Hamza Youssef, where he seemed extraordinarily sure about who's heading to number 10. And just this morning, he's writing to Keir Starmer, inviting him for talks. But what is the SNP's own plan for the election when things have gone so wrong? The ambition and the aim is twofold. One, to be the biggest party uh, in the general election here in Scotland. But secondly, to also wipe the Tories off the electoral map in Scotland. And of course, the fact that the SNP is second place in every single Tory seat in Scotland means that if people want to make Scotland Tory free, free of Tory MPs, then they have to vote for the SNP. The truthful situation here is that the more Labour MPs there are, the more likely a Labour government and therefore the more likely it is to get rid of the Tories or wipe them off the map, as you would put it. Keir Starmer is 20 to 25 percent ahead in the polls. He is going to be the next Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. I don't think you could point me to a single poll. It doesn't just show uh, that that isn't the case, but you probably couldn't even show me a single poll that suggests it is marginal. Keir Starmer does not need Scotland to win. It is deeply misleading to suggest to people that you know it's inevitable that Keir Starmer is going to be Prime Minister when we're probably 10 months away from an election. If you can show me a single poll that is suggesting this is going to be a marginal election, I would love to see it because I have not seen it at all. So what I would suggest is that it is undoubtedly the case that Keir Starmer it doesn't need Scotland uh, to win. He's going to be the next Prime Minister of the UK. We all know that. What I'm saying to voters in Scotland is vote for what you believe in. If you believe in a party that will always stand up for Scotland, if you believe in our values, if they're your values, such as scrapping tuition fees, such as scrapping pres prescription charges, generous offers of childcare, if these are your values, then help us to protect them. And when it comes to, to Keir Starmer being the next Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, which I think uh, he absolutely will be, I should say I'm very willing to work with an incoming Labour government, I think there's plenty we can work on. There'll be different disagreements, constitution perhaps being the obvious one. But I do think there's plenty of areas we could work on. So what do you mean by that? Have you spoken to him now? Were you planning to talk to him before the election if you're so, so sure he's going to be in number 10? Well, I have. I've written to Keir Starmer, invited him to Edinburgh for a discussion. I'd like to speak to Keir Starmer as the man who will uh, undoubtedly be the next Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and particularly on the issues of tackling child poverty. Um, I think we need to work together in order to tackle child poverty right across the United Kingdom. Uh, now, I think Keir Starmer should commit to, for example, lifting the two-child limit. And by doing so, we'd lift 250,000 children out of poverty across the UK, 15,000 children uh, here in Scotland. Uh, let's scrap the bedroom tax, which is keeping too many people in poverty. What are you suggesting, though, in terms of that discussion? Because when we spoke last in June, you seemed to believe a hung parliament was a likelihood, and you said that you would set out some conditions if you were ever to lend SNP MP support to Keir Starmer if he didn't have a majority of himself for his well, I suppose what I'm saying to Keir Starmer is SNP MPs uh, will work with you. It's hardly going to be a surprise that when I speak to Keir Starmer, and I hope he takes me up on the invitation uh, to me, that would be the grown-up, I think, responsible thing for him to do. Um, 
that I will advocate for a second independence referendum because I've got all of the reasons why I think uh, our mandate has been ignored over the years and I hope he'll take a, a, a respectful approach to listening to Scotland's voice. Do you accept, though, that he is not, if he gets to be Prime Minister, going to offer you another independence referendum? And for voters, you say, you've just said then, it will be on the ballot again, but you promised it to voters in 2017, didn't happen. In 2019, you promised again, it didn't happen. In 2022, the Supreme Court said, no, you don't have the power to make this happen again. Do you accept independence and another referendum? They're just not going to happen anytime soon. I, I don't accept it for two reasons. And you and I spoke about this last time we had an interview, that you've got to do two things. You've got to create both the political conditions and then you've got to create the popular support and the, and the conditions for popular support. So the political conditions is why the SNP, I believe, uh, have to win the general election. I want the SNP to win the general election to help to send a really strong message to Westminster that Scotland will not be ignored and will be very clear, page one, line one on the manifesto, vote for the SNP for but Scotland to become But you know your support's been sliding, an you know you're on track well, to lose not, seats. Not the support for independence, of course, and that's my second point, is you have to create the conditions for a consistent majority for independence. But for that to happen, you also have to be persuading people that you're a good and effective government. Let's turn to the impact of some of your policies right here, right now. Now, the billionaire businessman Tom Hunter is on the programme uh, on Sunday. He has a question about your higher taxes because higher rate taxpayers in Scotland are now paying significantly more than people do in England. Tom Hunter's question is, given Scotland now has six different tax bans as opposed to three in the UK, do you see this as an incentive for startups trying to grow businesses and talent to set up in Scotland? Now, that's a major big business voice. Oh, yeah, and I have very respect to them. about you making it much more expensive in some ways for people to do business here. Look, first and foremost, I've got a lot of time for Sir Tom Hunter. He and I won't always agree. We'll have disagreements, uh, clearly, but uh, he is an important business voice and one that I've engaged with uh, on a number of occasions. Do you remember in Scotland, the majority of taxpayers will pay less tax in Scotland than, of course, taxpayers elsewhere in the UK. In terms of those top 5% of earners that were asking to pay a little bit more, like First Ministers and people on MP salaries, they'll be asked to pay a little bit more so that we can continue to provide policies like free tuition, free university education, like scrapping prescription charges, like childcare, free, uh, a generous childcare offer. And despite those decisions that you've made, there are still significant problems in Scottish public services, real problems with waiting lists, and you've mentioned education. Well, after 13 and a half years of Tory austerity, but seeing our budget in real terms fall by £500 million, we are not just managing, I think we are doing incredibly well to make sure, for example, our A&E uh, departments well, are the best be performing the, state, the, the waiting entire. list. Well, I think, they I think people will recognise that we prioritise public services over tax cuts for the wealthy. And I think that is a political choice, undoubtedly a political choice, that and, we and take they, and it's one that I, I stand and on. And they are all choices, and you've mentioned education several times. During the SNP's tenure, Scottish schools have slipped back in the well-respected PISA ratings quite significantly. And Scottish schools and the education that Scottish kids get is now behind the education that English children are getting. Are you proud of that? Well, look, I, I said at the time when the PISA study stats came out that I didn't think that was good enough. And that's why one of the first things I did was actually enrol Scotland, as First Minister, enrol Scotland back into a whole uh, raft of international uh, studies, which we will do. But that, of course, tells one part of the story. If you look at, for example, the progress we've made in relation to reducing literacy and numeracy, if you look at the progress we've made in terms of young people achieving uh, uh, hires and, and, and advanced hires, we've managed to make progress in a number of areas. Scotland has slid in the international figures. And that is important. That matters to Scottish parents. It matters to Scotland's standing in the rest of the UK. You say yourself, it's not good enough. And you have been in charge here of health, of education, of many different things, and on many different measures, actually, the record does not look pretty. And in a way, there's a real parallel between the SNP and what's happening with the Conservatives across the UK. You've been in power for a long time. A lot of things seem to be going the wrong way. Your popularity has slid back. And there's a thing about sort of incumbency. People look and think, well, they're kind of out of ideas. Oh, I, Do you accept that parallel? Uh, no, I, I don't accept the parallel because I can point to the fact that through our actions, when it comes to the issue that I said will be the defining mission of the government that I lead, we had in 2023 90,000 fewer children 
in poverty. Uh, what I've said is that also when it comes to our health service, we can demonstrate that yes, there are absolutely challenges, but we've not lost a single day of the NHS to strike action, which is very different to Wales, very different to England. When I look about, when I look at our other public services, we have that recorded crime at record low levels under the SNP. Just lastly, um, you have been one of the UK politicians who's repeatedly called for a ceasefire in Gaza. Um, why do you think others have hesitated before doing that? I, I think there's just a lack of leadership and moral courage, uh, if I'm being frank. And, and this is a classic example of where I think nobody understands what Keir Starmer stands for. Why has he not shown the appropriate leadership on the issue of Gaza? And I don't know the answer to that, uh, but I don't know uh, uh, how anybody can see that level, as I say, of death and destruction and not call for an immediate uh, halt and an immediate ceasefire. Do you think sometimes people place a different value on Palestinian lives, on without, Muslim lives? Without a shadow of a doubt, that if you talk to anybody who's Palestinian, um, you speak to many people in the Muslim community, they feel that the Palestinian blood is very cheap. First Minister, thank you very much indeed for speaking to us. Thank you. Well, let's see what our trio at the desk made of those two interviews, and let's stick with the Middle East. Um, Nikki, you heard there Hamza Yusuf's very strong views mm. that Palestinians are simply not regarded in the same way that we look at Israelis. But also Grant Shapps, the Defence Secretary, saying that Benjamin Netanyahu's position against a two-state solution is disappointing. What can the UK government actually do to try to shift that? Because they believe it's a stumbling block, but yet they don't seem very able to do anything about it. Well, I thought it was fascinating that actually Grant Shapps was quite so so clear. Um, mm -hmm. And people might watch you might think disappointing is not a strong word, but actually coming from the UK Defence Secretary against a statement made by uh, an overseas prime minister, I think that is pretty strong. I think the UK has to work uh, in, in the UN multilaterally with our um, allies, with countries such as the US. I think the Foreign Secretary David Cameron has visited Israel. No doubt there will be further uh, visits, many, many behind the scenes conversation. But I think probably, um, I'd like to think most of Westminster would be uh, disappointed, um, at least by Benjamin Netanyahu's comments, because I think the two-state solution has to be um, the only way, or one of the only ways, out of the current difficulty seen. And as Simon was saying earlier on, you know, uh, what we've seen happen in Israel and Gaza, the worry is, of course, it spreads to other countries unintentionally. And Simon, you've spent a lot of time I mean, all over the world, but in that region too. How is the West's pronouncement sort of viewed? You know, does it matter what America's saying? Does it matter what the UK says? I'm not convinced it matters what the UK says. Mm. Uh, it certainly matters what America says. If anyone has any influence over the Israelis in this situation, it is the states. But of course, the President Biden thinks that his hands are somewhat tied. I think he's. I think he would be more able to do more than he actually is. But it, that's not to say that the Americans haven't been involved for decades. They have. They've, they've, they've done more than anyone to try and take these two sides to the negotiating table and to some sort of agreement. It's not a good situation. It really isn't. And we can sit here and we can talk in rational terms about people discussing and coming to negotiations, etc. But there are some real extremists on both sides in this situation. I think we don't quite recognise the depths of the fury, the anger, the rage, the hatred and the nuttery, frankly, that exists in, in this situation as well. I'm really worried about the chances for the two-state solution. I think it's almost been driven out of being a possibility over the last few decades by the endless settlement and settlers in the West Bank. How on earth will they create a functioning two-state solution? But I agree, what other possibility is there? What other solution is there to this? But I absolutely promise everyone that unless we resolve this, unless we absolutely take, and take real care and concern about this, this has the ability and the potential to detonate a wider situation, not just in the Middle East, but one that will affect us all. We're going to talk about Hamza Yusuf in a second, Tom, but I just wondered, were you more or less reassured having listened to Grant Chaps? Oh, goodness, reassured listening to politicians, Laura. <laughs> um, um, I don't know about reassured. It's not obviously not my specialist subject, but coming to it as an amateur, what other solution mm. could there be? The right for Palestinians to have their own country, the right for Israel to have secure borders, that is common sense. Mm. This is the time for political leadership to really come to the fore. And I'm worried about the quality 
of political leadership around the world to mm. come up with these solutions. Well, let's then talk about your part of the world, where there are worries about the quality of the political leadership. Hamza Youssef, we spoke to at length this week, and I think it is fair to say, we talked to pollsters, he's not yet seen by many people as a really compelling leader. He's not sort of been able to take the situation by the scruff of the neck. Fair to say also he's inherited a very difficult situation in Scotland. Um, but what did you think of how he positioned himself today with this claim again and again, Keir Starmer is inevitably going to be Prime Minister, so you can vote SNP. Yeah, well, goodness me, a, a political leader saying that an, a, an opposition party is definitely going to be Prime Minister of the UK. I, I don't think I've ever heard that before. <laughs> but um, there's, let's start with what I agree with Hamza on. Don't worry, it's a short list. <laughs> um, so we would both agree that we want our country, Scotland, to grow and flourish. But then we disagree how we're going to do it. Let's be clear, governments don't make wealth in a country. Business people, entrepreneurs, hardworking individuals who are out there striving create the wealth. Governments should create an environment in which that can happen. And then they decide to tax us and spend our money. And we have a chance every four or five years to decide if, if they're doing a good job or not. And this is where I believe um, 16 years of the same government in mm -hmm. Scotland is far too long. That's not a political statement. And I've, our audience should know you've never said what side you're on no, in the independence debate, so you're not coming from one particular side or another. I've never been a member of a political another. party, and I never will be. My mm -hmm. wife wouldn't allow it. <laughs> and, um, but what, what we believe in is we believe in entrepreneurs and businesses being allowed to thrive, to create the jobs, and, the, and we believe in our foundation, the best social policy ever written is a decent paid job. And what's happening in Scotland, as I believe, is the government believes they know best, but the facts are not with them. We have got a ferry contract that the government's taken over that's mm. going to cost the Scottish taxpayer 300 million. We've got a deposit return scheme, which was put in by people with no business experience. Mm. It's going to cost 50 million. How many nurses, how many teachers? How many policemen could that pay for? But when we asked him your question about the extra taxation for the wealthy, he made the point, look, suck it up, because that pays for free tuition, it pays for free prescriptions. What did you think of his answer to your question? Yeah. So we agree again that the people with the broader shoulders should carry the heaviest burden. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But that is happening in Scotland. 11% mm -hmm. of the Scottish taxpayers, of which I'm one, pay 65% of the whole income tax um, collected in Scotland. Mm -hmm. So the people with the broader shoulders are carrying the heaviest burden. Where we absolutely disagree is that I want more wealth creators. I want more people in Scotland and starting and growing their businesses. We, we did a, a investigation with Oxford Economics mm -hmm. about the Irish. An Ireland is going to run a 60 billion surplus over the next three years. Scotland's going to run a 30 billion deficit. And you think Scotland could take lessons and from Ireland? I think let's create more. And we don't get that by having six different bands of income tax. Mm. That's double what we have here in England. And that is ridiculous. And the people in the Scottish business community who I listen to, they don't believe this government has their back, mm. and that is a very bad situation. OK, well, it's interesting to put your question to him, to hear his response and to hear your response. Um, I want to just briefly touch on Rwanda. So Nicky Grantchap said it has to go through. He thinks the Lords absolutely has to pass it. Will you let it through? Your Lords, Rishi Sunak said this week, <laughs> it's the will of the people. You have to get on with it. Well, I hesitate to speak on the whole behalf of the whole House of Lords, but I was sorry that Grant didn't take your bet because I think the bill will go through uh, the House of Lords. Um, I would just say to uh, number 10 that the last Prime Minister who used the will of the people language, it wasn't a happy precedent. Um, <laughs> I think with the House of Lords, the thing to do is to give it time. It is a scrutinising chamber. Um, there's, there's lots of people, uh, lawyers, diplomats, others who rightly will say, are you sure about this? Do you want to let it through? But um, ultimately, that is what a scrutinising chamber is about. But we are very clear, we are not the elected 
uh, chamber and therefore actually if the government wants this to go through I think ultimately it will. But the political push from Rishi Sunak is not something that you appreciate I think you're saying yeah, diplomatically. I think, I think if you put the House of Lords, in my experience I've only been there for just over four years, if you put the House of Lords under too much pressure and sort of try to, you, there are no um, timetable motions in the House of Lords so you don't do what the House of Commons does in terms of sort of truncating debate. So if you actually allow them to talk, to debate, to scrutinise, to say do you want to, are you sure you want to do this? I think overall they will get the result they want. So you'll do 10. it in your own sweet time, I think you're saying. I think um, that's right. Simon, just briefly, what do you think of the Rwanda policy? You spent a lot of time in Africa. Goodness. Um, I think it's a gimmick. Um, I think it's designed to appeal to voters rather than to actually affect actual change. But I would step back slightly from it as an issue and, and say, what, I don't think we talk about en enough about what we, are, what are we trying to achieve? What is our ultimate game mm. or, get, or, 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 or target in with this or on the migration issue in, in the round? For me personally, my principal issue and desire mm. is to make poorer countries a bit wealthier, that our brothers and sisters out there on planet Earth live better, more fulfilling lives. I do not think that is achieved necessarily by mass migration. I think mm -hmm. mass migration is a bit of a racket in many ways. And I think often, too often people on the left don't see it for what it is, which is often, in my view, what I see is us as wealthy countries mm -hmm. poaching, nicking and nabbing clever, bright, wonderful people from poorer countries, bringing them over mm -hmm. to work as pizza delivery people and as courier drivers. I don't necessarily think that helps them. It certainly doesn't always help their countries. I'm, I'm in too many countries mm -hmm. where up to 90% of the university educated professionals have left. It's an interesting aspect of the conversations, maybe not talked about that much in Westminster and in this country. Just before we move on, um, briefly, we talked a lot on this programme and we spoke at length to Michelle Moan just before Christmas. Tom, you're somebody who knows her. I think you were actually one of her original investors. I was. Now, this has all turned into a pretty big mess. She's under investigation. I don't want you to talk about a criminal inquiry. And, you know, she has said she lied about what happened, but they deny doing anything wrong in terms of the deal they did. What do you think about what's happened to her, knowing her, knowing her when you did as a young businesswoman? Yeah, so, I mean, we, we helped Michelle in her early days and... and one of the key aims of our foundation is we help hundreds of companies in Scotland start and grow. But um, what I think happened, let's put it in context, um, when the pandemic hit, there was no one person in the world knew how to deal with it because there wasn't a living soul who'd lived through a pandemic. And therefore, the government, in my opinion, panicked. But I understand the panic mm -hmm. and there wasn't enough PPE and there was this VIP lane. Mm -hmm which probably in paper looked okay. So who can help us get this? But then it turns out it's friends of government ministers who went down, who maybe hadn't made this thing in the past. But do you think she's been treated fairly? She's very clear that she's been made a scapegoat. And do you, or do you look at her, at what's happened to her and think, it's just a terribly sad mess, but she may have made mistakes. What do you think? I think she's her own worst enemy. I think she has, in her interview with yourself mm. you know it, it was a car crash interview why did she decide to do it you must be very persuasive but <laughs> she is not the only one who benefited if i had been running the government which thank god i'm not um i would have said can you help us but i'm putting a cap on the profits you can make mm -hmm. because there's something above mm. profit here mm. our country is in dire straits we need your help as entrepreneurs but let's cap the profit okay. you can make. All right, well, hindsight might be a wonderful thing. I think it's staggering thing, how people sought to yeah. profit in that situation. What does it say about society? Well, there's a lot of conversation mm. about that, and a lot of it we've had in this studio. All three, thank you so much for now. We'll be back with you at the end of the show. And, of course, remember, you can tell us what you think, send in questions or comments, Coonsberg at bbc.co.uk, or if you're social media-minded, you can use the hashtag BBC Laura Kay, and we'll share some of your thoughts at the end of the show. But let's talk about the Labour Party. Hamza Youssef, as we heard, reckons they're dead certs to win the election, or at least that's his political message. But remember, it's a huge task for Labour to get there. Keir Starmer needs a bigger swing than Tony Blair to get a majority of just one. So can they do it? Yvette Cooper is the politician who would be Labour's next Home Secretary if you win in the election. Welcome to the studio. Good morning, Laura. First of all, our viewers would have seen this terrible story where four people were found dead at a home in Norfolk. The police have referred themselves for an investigation because they didn't respond to a 999 call from that property. 
What do you think of that? Yeah, this is deeply troubling. It's an awful case. You've got two young girls who've been killed as part of it. Rightly, this case has now been referred for investigation because there does appear to have been a 999 call that wasn't responded to. We obviously don't know the details on this individual case, but I do think there is a wider issue here about the 999 response to particularly domestic abuse cases. We had the awful, awful case of Ranim Uda and her mother who were killed after repeated 999 calls were not responded to. So we are saying that Labour would put domestic abuse specialists into 999 control centres so that you've got that expertise to deal with difficult cases. We don't know whether that would have made any difference or applied in this case and there needs to be an investigation but I do think there is a wider issue about making sure we have the proper response to these kinds of awful cases. And do you think that people watching this morning can have confidence in the 999 system? Well, that's why I think you need to have that expertise in control rooms so that the, the kinds of calls that come in, you've got that understanding of the nature of domestic abuse threats. Look, in the end, as we know, the police are having to pick up the pieces from all kinds of different crises, be they mental health, be they other crises and failings elsewhere in the system. And they are often overstretched. But we need to make sure that people can have the confidence mm -hmm. that if they are in an emergency, the police will be there when they need them. And I think actually for too often, people don't feel that's the case. And that is part of the damage I think that's been done to policing and the criminal justice system over many years. Let's talk about asylum then. Mm -hmm. We talked a lot in the studio in the last few weeks about the Rwanda plan, but let's talk about asylum claims. Now, we want to speak about Labour's principles when it comes to people coming to this country to seek asylum. Last year, just under 39,000 people were granted asylum. Then there was a further 112,000 who came from Hong Kong and Ukraine. Um, so there was a total of 150,000 people coming to this country, either as refugees or seeking asylum. Do you think that number is about right or is it too high? I think we've had to respond to very specific situations. So, for example, Ukraine and Hong Kong have been one-off situations in that Ukraine, there was obviously important for all European countries to respond as the nearest neighbours to Ukraine. And we did so many families across the country mm -hmm. took in Ukrainian families. We've done so ourselves. And that, I think, has been important. And then on Hong Kong, again, the UK had some very specific mm -hmm obligations but those have been both one-off mm. off schemes so there were and nearly 40,000 asylum claims accepted and many of those people would have arrived here illegally do you think that number is too high it's the highest granted since 2002 I think where the problem is is the the boat crossings and we think that uh, look, this is undermining our border security mm -hmm. and also putting lives at risk so we need action to stop the dangerous boat crossings and we have to strengthen our border security before in we order get to into do that, so Yvette as Cooper, well as having but a, before a we get into that system. and we will but mm. before we get into how the system actually works nearly 40,000 people were granted as asylum here that is, as I said, the highest number granted in a year since 2002. On a matter of principle, is that too high or are you comfortable with that number? I don't think you can set specific numbers at a time when you have to respond to what the situation is in, in different parts of the world. What I do think, though, that we should be doing is working internationally mm. to make sure that actually refugees can get support in the region. We used to do much more of that. Mm. And now a lot of the aid budget that used to be used to actually make sure that so people could get support in neighbouring countries, that they weren't exploited by people smugglers, that they didn't make these huge long journeys, but it, instead has been used to pay bills for asylum hotels in the UK. Well, we should be ending the asylum hotel it, use and actually tackling some of those issues at source. That but, would be far more effective. But I want to press you again, though, on the principle of this number. Is 40,000 a number that you are comfortable with in the situation with so much disruption and instability in the world? Or is it something that you would like to come down? Because it is the highest number since 2002. And also the rate of asylum claims that are accepted initially has gone up significantly as well. It's now at about a 75%. Before the pandemic, it was only about a third of initial claims that have been accepted. So on principle, are you comfortable with that as a number? 
Well, again, I think you just can't set specific numbers. You have to respond to the circumstances like we did with Ukraine and Hong Kong. But the circumstances but I think that we're in now, we is that a number doing, that you're, well, you're comfortable with? What I think we certainly should be doing is ending the boat crossings because the, that means working in partnership, tackling the criminal gangs. It means strengthening our border security. And it means also making sure that we've got a properly managed and controlled asylum system. The UK does always need to do our bit to help those who fled persecution and conflict. However, we also should be making sure that those who have no right to be mm. here are swiftly returned. That's not happening at the moment. Uh, in fact, there's been a 50% drop in the returns of those who have no right to be here, who are failed cases since uh, the Conservatives took office. The and I... that's why we would also set up the new returns and enforcement unit, a major new returns and enforcement unit, to make sure that that is turned around but, as well. But the reason I'm trying to press you on the number, and our viewers will hear that you don't want to answer that question directly, there are some people on the left who would say we should never set a number we should take people in need that's absolutely what we should do as a caring and compassionate country so somebody in your position said i wouldn't put a limit on it on the other side there are some people who say if people are in dire need of course we mustn't turn them away but 40,000 a number that's the highest it's been since 2002 is too many well, so why won't you give a view on that. I'm not saying you should or not, but I think people want to understand why you won't give a view. Well, look, I think there's, there's separate parts to that question. The first is, you know, this issue around whether it be Ukraine, Hong Kong, whether it be what's happened in Afghanistan, all countries need to respond to situations across the world. Secondly, the reason for those figures that you were referring to is actually as a result of the Conservatives losing control of border security along the Channel. And so there has been a big increase in dangerous boat crossings that has been really damaging both to border security and also putting lives at risk. And that's, and that's why it's so important to go after the criminal gangs. Uh, and we should be trying to tackle that. What we also uh, need to do, we have have had a debate, for example, in Parliament about the kinds of resettlement routes and so on. And we do support there being caps on those sorts of resettlement schemes, making sure that you have properly controlled and managed you, systems, but, because that, I think, is sensible. But do you, you need the system mm -hmm. to be controlled and managed for people to have confidence in it, but you also need to make sure that the rules are properly enforced they're not being at the moment. That is undermining the credibility of the whole but system. Do you think it is the government's job to create a deterrent, which is what the government would say it's doing with its Rwanda scheme. And let's not rehearse all the arguments for and against that. We know that you don't approve of that scheme. But do you believe the government has a responsibility to create a deterrent to try to stop people making the journey to this country? Well, whatever you do has to be workable. And it is important to say that the Rwanda scheme will only ever cover less than 1% of those arriving in the country to the tune of £400 million being sent to Rwanda for a scheme that's sending more home secretaries than asylum seekers to Rwanda. I think the issues around this is we should, there's in the moment, there is no deterrent for the criminal gangs. They are currently able to operate with impunity. They've been able to take hold along our border. And that's why we've set out a major plan which would increase capacity, additional cross-border police uh, to go after the criminal gangs, additional security powers for them so that they can take action against people smugglers and also new agreement with Europe on that security cooperation so that you can tackle the supply chains, the way that the boats are being shipped across Europe mm -hmm. and stop the boats reaching the French and, coast and in the first it, place. That is, that that is immensely used. important. At the moment, mm -hmm. Prosecutions for people smuggling have dropped by 36%. And that is, and the, that the, is just the, shocking. And, and it means they're not taking action on the criminal just, gangs. Just before we close, mm. um, I'm not sure if you heard, but in case you didn't, the First Minister of Scotland, Hamza Youssef, has extended an invitation to Keir Starmer to go to Edinburgh for talks with him about what he'll do when he, uh, as he claims, inevitably becomes Prime Minister. Should Keir Starmer go and see the First Minister? I think the people in Scotland want to see a Labour government. They, we want them to vote Labour to do so. At the moment, in, in Scotland, they're suffering from having two failing governments, a but failing government in Westminster and a failing government in Scotland. We're not doing deals with the SNP. The important thing is to have a Labour government elected to get rid of the Conservatives where everything feels broken right across the okay, country. Well, We've this, had low this, growth, low opportunities. It's time for something better. Okay, people deserve okay. a fair 
Okay, yeah, well, there are plenty of people who come to the studio who would disagree with you. Many people watching might disagree with you too. But Yvette Cooper, you've set out Labour's position this morning. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed for being with us. Now, time has zipped along. It is nearly 10 o'clock. But we started talking about a very serious subject. Here is what the Defence Secretary Grant Shapps had to say about the Israeli Prime Minister's firm rejection of a two-state solution for Israel. I think it's very disappointing uh, that Benjamin Netanyahu has uh, said that. It's not in some sense as a surprise. He's spent his entire political career uh, against a two-state solution. But the point is, which other route is there to seriously resolve this? Well, brief word, Nikki. I can see you were uh, animatedly wondering about what Yvette Cooper had said. Yeah, well, I was wondering just uh, obviously about Yvette Cooper, but, um, but also um, uh, the, the commission that I was chairing. Ah, well, indeed. Well, we're going to talk about the COVID, <laughs> the, the COVID commission, which is one of the things that you've taken up since you left the House of Commons. There is now going to be a COVID Memorial Day. Tell us what the plan is. Yeah, look, just very briefly, um, I was asked to chair the UK Commission on COVID Commemoration to remember lives lost, the sacrifices people made who worked through it, the contribution of UK science. Marie Curie have uh, taken up the first recommendation, which is to have a National Day of Reflection, which will be on the first Sunday of March, this year the 3rd of March. Uh, details at dayofreflection.org.uk. And uh, I think it's an important period. Um, of course, for many people, it's passed, but for many people watching, they will be living with the, the loss of a loved one or even long COVID or just things that they weren't able to do for a period of time. And Tom, what do you feel about the COVID inquiry? We've seen this week all sorts of embarrassments of things that were going on in the Scottish government at the time. So what do we want from our politicians, Laura? We want honesty, we want competence and we want accountability. Throughout the COVID inquiry, we have seen none of that. Do you feel that? I mean, our former First Minister said, of course, she would share every piece of information, including WhatsApps, and then all of a sudden, the WhatsApps have disappeared. Well, there have been lots of mysterious cases of disappearing mm. WhatsApps, and then Nicola Sturgeon put out a slightly contradictory statement yesterday, so it's a bit yeah. of a mystery to be untangled. Let's close our conversations this morning, however, with something enjoyable and fun to look forward to. <laughs> Simon, you are back yes. on the TV tonight <laughs> with your latest series of Wilderness. We can show people some amazing pictures of you crossing what looks like endless icy wastes in Patagonia. Tell us about it. What's your favourite bit? Well, this, this bit was very chilly, it definitely <laughs> was. So we're up in the South Patagonian ice field at this point in, in the pictures you're seeing, um, which is a huge area of uh, frozen ice high in the Andes Mountains that hardly anybody knows about. We went to some of the last great wilderness areas on the planet. Um, it sounds like a jolly adventure, I'm sure, but I hope there is a serious point to it. You know, these are uh, a reminder, I think, that there is still a beautiful, magnificent planet out there. Despite everything we have and are doing to destroy it, stupidly, there is a planet worth believing in and fighting for. Um, and these wilderness areas, us, they, they matter to us. The, these places matter to us. We are connected to one ecosystem on this planet. And we need to recognise that the billions of trees in the heart of the Congo rainforest, for example, are an integral part of the ecosystem on which we all depend. So underlying the jolly adventure mm -hmm. um, and the blisters and everything else in the programmes, there is, I hope, that, that message as well, that uh, wildernesses matter to us and they do still exist. And that jolly adventure did nearly go quite badly wrong. Is it true a lion tried to get into your tent? <laughs> it was. I don't think it was trying to get in. It was trying to lick some moisture <laughs> off the side of my tent. Um, but there were a few moments like that, yes, because when you step out when you get into those wild places unpredictable stuff happens and you have to react to it as best you can um, and we accepted that as part of the adventure and experience but yes there, there are I'm getting slightly sweaty palms at the memory <laughs> of that moment that was a that was a very scary moment in my in my little tent on my own okay well we're very pleased that the line didn't get you no thank you yeah. all for joining us Pleasure. in the political jungle thank here you. in yes. our studio this morning wilderness is on bbc2 i think tonight BBC and bbc i player don't PM. miss that because mm -hmm. they've been huge hits previously and i'm sure the latest series will be great <laughs> thank too. you thank you all three for very much for being with us this morning thank you obviously for watching when we've talked about all sorts of different things but also a very serious Serious subject. We've been trying to work out how our politicians can manage risks abroad and here at home. Did we manage to get to the bottom of it? 
Well, we gave it a go, but I'm sure with everything going on in 2024, we will have plenty more conversations on these issues in the coming weeks. Thank you so much for watching today. I'll see you later on today's edition of Newscast with Paddy O'Connell. Of course, you can always catch up on iPlayer 2 if you're not watching Simon's programme. But if telly and sofa is your traditional thing, I'll look forward to seeing you here next Sunday, of course. Same time, same place. Goodbye.